uh, when someone comes in your to your office, let's say who's 55 or 60 or onward, um, typically what do they want? Well, I'll tell you one thing that's interesting, Andy. I think the thermostat has changed on what the what the general public considers older. And I, I have this conversation every day. I think a lot of times when we when we used to think about 50, 60 year old people, it would be that's an older person. But now 70 and 80 or year old people are the older people. And the 50, 60 year olds are looking at their body saying, well, I definitely don't look the way that I feel because we all do feel better. It's a more health conscious society. Um, our, our, even if we're not health conscious, our life expectancy is still more. And so we feel a little bit more invincible, kind of like when we were in our teens and 20s, we didn't feel like the end was near. And so a 50, 60 year old may not feel the end is near either, and they don't feel like they should look older. So that's one thing that I think plays a little bit of a role in the impetus to get cosmetic surgery or cosmetic treatments in that age group. Um, the other, go ahead. Oh, well, no, I was going to say, so I, I guess that means you, uh, you want to look the way you feel. You want to look the way you feel, that's for sure. I think that it keeps, if people are more active at an older age now, um, both physically and in the workplace. And so they also want to look the way that they feel in the workplace and in their physical lives way more active. And a lot of them will come in and they're fit as a fiddle. And they'll tell me, look, I'm 60 years old. I run marathons. But what's up with these bags underneath my eyes? This doesn't look like the people I'm running with. And so we sort of take care of those little things to make them look the way that they feel and the way that they want to want to be seen and the way that they behave. Um, so I think this definitely translates into the workplace that they want to want to be seen and the way that they behave. Um, so I think this definitely translates into the workplace. I don't think that anybody's bold enough or um, uh, I can't think of the right word other than bold. I don't think anybody's bold enough or rude enough to say that there's an expectation that you look younger when you're in the workplace today. If you are an older person, I think that there's definitely some benefit and some um, advantages to having a more mature look, especially in finance, especially in medicine. I'll tell you in my particular field, for the first eight or nine years of my practice, I had a really hard time booking facelifts. And my colleagues who were the same age, but a little bit chubbier and less hair on their heads, had a very easy time booking those facelifts. There's nothing different about what we said to people or anything. It's just that sometimes when you look a little bit older, sometimes you might be thought of as a bit more trustworthy. Um, sure. Yeah, that's so, in, so, so you're finding that uh, you're uh, that uh, people can use that to their advantage, uh, like you say, in certain sure. fields in particular. Absolutely. And by the same token, though, now if you consider someone who looks just old and tired, for example, around the eyes, that's a huge area where people uh, feel like they are aging. Uh, because, you know, you might see a little bit of droopiness here, you might see wrinkles. I don't think anybody's really wrinkle biased or. Um, uh, what's the word? I'm thinking of wrinkle phobe, but it's not. That's not what I'm thinking. But I think I don't think anybody has really any biases against wrinkles themselves. But a tired look is not often thought of as a look that's trustworthy in someone who's going to be representing you. For example, if it's a lawyer, someone who's going to be recommending stock choices or recommending financial moves or plastic surgery, for example. So if you're looking at a professional like that then yeah, you want someone who doesn't look tired, they look energetic, but they need to look a little mature and seasoned so they've got the experience behind the belt. So that puts these this group of people in a very specific category. So we're not trying to reverse the 60-year-old to look like a 30-year-old where they look less experienced, or in this, in this day and age, a 30-year-old is considered a millennial now, so you wouldn't trust them with anything, right? That's kind of a different scenario, <laughs> yeah. though. I guess <laughs> it's come down to that. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, man, I'm going to be making his payments for his car soon. Uh-huh, yeah. But, but I think we're trying to get the 60-year-old who feels, you know, I'm energetic, I'm, I'm with it, everything's great, but I look a little tired. We're trying to get those people to look a little bit more energetic and look the part that they're trying to play, which is 
person who can handle the job with confidence. Yeah. yeah I, as an, an editor and as a writer uh, for this particular age group, which I'm in, uh, I often ask uh, my friends and people I come in contact with, you know, what's important to them at this point in their life and uh, you know, the things, words like social security and, and, and how they look. Uh, so it, uh, it's not something of a myth, I think, uh, if uh, anyone were to believe that after you reach a certain point. Still probably a greater percentage of people who are older who definitely and absolutely care about the way that they look. And those who say that they don't, either really don't or feel that they can't afford it or they don't deserve it for some reason. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's another issue because the Asian population, a lot of times maybe they're retired, um, maybe they're in jobs that they're working in that don't pay very well and therefore their retirement is not that great. Maybe their retirement took a hit in stock market changes. Fortunately, we haven't had that for a while, but um, the affordability of treatments can sometimes play a role as well. And you were, sounds like you were about to say that uh, affordability is, uh, is, a, is available or, are you, or is, it, is it indeed uh, something that you've got to be uh, a little bit more well to do, well off to, 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 to afford? Well, no, not necessarily anymore. I think that affordability is greater now than it has been in the past several decades. Um, probably for the past decade and a half, we've been seeing greater affordability because the marketplace is inundated with plastic surgeons. It's also inundated with different options than other than, than the traditional facelift, eyelid lift treatments where fillers and Botox and laser treatments and non-surgical skin tightening look like Ulthera or Thermage treatments can offer a lot of benefits to patients and allow them to feel a little bit more like they look a little bit more well rested and a little bit more confident with their looks and cost way less than the original traditional surgeries used to cost. Now I gather that uh, something like Botox has really made a big change in, uh, in the cosmetic use of uh, medication, I, uh, whatever that proper yeah. term is. Huh? Absolutely. It's a huge impact on so many different levels. Um, it's number one, I think it's it's a really nice way of lifting up eyebrows and lifting up eyes and sort of opening up some of the angry kind of tired look that's in the forehead area and in between the eyes. But in addition to that, consistent use of Botox, which we see that now in many people starting from age 20s, Sometimes in the mid 20s, they'll start for crow's feet and lines on their foreheads. But consistent use has allowed us to prevent a lot of wrinkling and a lot of aging that would have otherwise been a lot worse. So it's made a huge impact on yeah. the industry. When someone comes into your office uh, who's, say, over 65, uh, what is the what, what's a typical conversation um, that you have? I suppose they, you know, people have a certain specific idea, but what, what's a conversation that you might have with somebody? Most important is establishing their goals. We start originally with what really brings them there. What, what makes them upset when they look at themselves? Or is there something that has been said to them or something they feel others are focusing on that bothers them? Typically, it happens to be aging around the eyes. And then the next step is to determine and to try to evaluate and, and with great attention to their personal needs, what can they tolerate and accommodate? What can they get away with doing? Um, some may come in and say, well, you know, I really hate my jowls, but there's no way I'm ever going to have a facelift. So let's focus on my eyes because they make me look tired and I feel like when I'm working at the bank, People look into my eyes, think I'm tired, and people may comment on it. That's often a, a source of uh, um, a real impetus for people to come in and see me, where they they feel either work worker, um, coworker, or a client has come in and they've commented, "Why do you look so tired all the time?" Um, but usually, it's trying to figure out what their number one, what their goals are, what would really make them happy, and then what kind of treatments can they tolerate and really do and get away with at this point. And uh, so there might be a process involved from uh, one 
procedure and maybe something later or uh, once? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Because a lot of times there are small procedures that we do like fillers and injections and Botox and that kind of stuff that we can do the day of the visit, for example, to my office, the first visit. And then on a subsequent uh, setting, we'll do a lower eyelid blepharoplasty or upper eyelid blepharoplasty to remove some of the extra fat and skin around the eyes to remove some of that tired look around the eyes. And um, I guess uh, it, you know I have to at least address the costs a little bit because that always seems to be a, a curiosity. Uh, yeah. What kind of uh, costs are we looking at? In general, um, so let's let's kind of break it down into some specifics. In general, a purely just Botox treatment session would be anywhere between six hundred to nine hundred dollars. Um, there can sometimes be as low as three or four hundred if you're looking for coupon deals. Generally, finding someone who's more trustworthy and consistent in their treatment methods and and their results is going to be roughly around six hundred to nine hundred dollars. Fillers, um, usually, for example. One of the more common treatments is the filler under the eye and in the cheek area to undo some of the hollowing in that area and in the temporal. You may spend somewhere between $1,000 to $2,000 on one treatment, and that's multiple syringes doing multiple different areas to get things smoothed out. Um, surgically, around the eyes, if the upper and lower eyelids are treated at the same time, you're looking anywhere between 6000 to about roughly 15000 in Beverly Hills. It sort of varies. And then facelifting is, again, roughly 8000 to about 20000 in Beverly Hills, sometimes a little cheaper outside of this area. And how long do some of those treatments last, uh, the, you know, the fillers, the Botox, and, and those? Botox is pretty consistent about three to four months and is best when it is consistently repeated about every three or four months. The fillers may last anywhere between six months to two years, depending on what kind of fillers are used and which area on the face we're talking about. So they definitely require maintenance and repeating, but you can sometimes get away with it every year or every two years with the fillers. Um, are you uh, indeed seeing uh, older people coming into your office? Absolutely, all the time, all the time. And you referenced as much as 80-year-olds. Uh, uh, I imagine that's kind of the exception. Uh, yes, in fact, the last 80-year-old I saw was, um, what's today, Wednesday? On Monday. Huh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She is uh, the mother of one of my patients, two of my patients actually, the two sisters are both my patients. One of them's getting married, the younger one. And she being the mother came in and said, what can you do for me before the wedding? I want to look tip top, I want to look amazing. I'm the mother of the bride. Of course. And a, a number of injections, we split it up into two sessions so that she can handle the, the pain and the anguish of, of the treatment at her, at her fragile age. But she is 81, 81. That's great, a great story there. And, yeah. you know, and I, then we also hear, as you referenced earlier, that uh, there is a, well, I don't, you didn't call it this, but I, I guess I'll call it that. And there's a, there is a, an age bias out there. And so uh, people who are uh, still working after 55 and 60 and on up, uh, they want to avoid bias and, and not. Uh, uh, let, let, not let people make assumptions and sometimes how you look uh, is, a, is a solution to that isn't it you know I have Andy a number of patients whose ages whose real ages I don't know um, and as a physician that's a little frustrating because that's one of the you know you go to medical school that's one of the basic intake uh, data you get the patient's age and you get their <laughs> their gender and you get their you know you, you kind of know things about them and I've had the opportunity in a couple of cases to talk to people a little bit more frankly and they've said, look, you cannot talk about my age to anybody. I'm going to refer you people. When my friend comes, don't go telling her, doesn't she look great for 70 years old? Because you can't do that. And they usually happen to be either the really socially active people in, in the LA area or um, actors and actresses who are still pretty active in trying to get roles here and there in different shows that they can get or in different movies that they can get. They don't let me talk about it. 
but there is definitely an age bias and a lot of those people when you look at them with all the work that's been done and with the maintenance that's been done you really can't tell yeah you really can't and uh, outside of uh, Los Angeles and New York and uh, Miami uh, uh, these kind of services are available uh, anywhere huh they're definitely available um, we have, again, I think that there's a selection bias in the patients that I see. We have patients who come from out of town because they want to come to this area to do their treatments. Um, and they, they'll tell me, you know, I would do this and that over there, meaning the Botox and the fillers, but I don't trust those doctors in the Midwest with my surgery, so I'm coming to you for that. Mm. And so it, I think the treatment is definitely available. It is safely available. And it is done very well outside of the LA area. I don't think we have any real specific magical talent that other doctors don't have. But for some reason, we deal with this a little bit more often, so people trust us more with it. And you mentioned Groupon, so you can find some deals out there. Absolutely, yes. And every once in a while, you may find a gem with Groupon. The one caveat is, and, and with all respect to my colleagues who might be hearing this, who run Groupon advertisements, Sometimes you've, you've got to accommodate so much traffic that that rapid, fast-paced um, traffic that's going through the office has to, has to give way somewhere. And I think the quality of treatment and or the connection with the patient is lost. And that's not always the best for getting the best result. Yeah, that's so true on, on any, any relationship you have. Um, anything that we're missing here that uh, we want to we talk about? Um, we haven't talked about safety in this age group. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. An that's an important factor. Um, I have a number of patients, and I just saw a couple who are friends with my in-laws who are the, the man in the couple I know is in his 80s, and the woman is in her 70s. I went to school, college, and attended medical school at the same time as their son. And so it's a real honor to see them. Yeah. And the two of them have both had trouble with their heart. They've both had heart attacks. And so they're both on Plavix, they're both on aspirin, and these are common medications that are given after stents are placed in coronary vessels to keep the vessels open. And so that increases their risks with regard to bruising and swelling and uh, sometimes even bleeding during procedures. Now fortunately we're just doing little Botox and filler treatments for them. But the safety is definitely a concern in this age group when it comes to these things. I think if you're in good health, if you're in overall good health and you have a physician that's constantly overlooking your health and make sure that your heart is healthy and so on, then any treatment is safe, be it filler, be it Botox or be it surgery. Your risk for having a complication under anesthesia is definitely a little bit greater and should be weighed with the benefits that you may gain from surgery. So a lot of times, in my practice at least, I may push people towards more non-surgical treatments if their health status is not so good, and towards more surgical treatments if their health status is, is very good. So we sort of weigh these things out, and they do affect the way that we uh, pick and choose the treatments that we can offer the patient. The other thing is, a lot of times medications and supplements that we may be on can sometimes cause risks with surgeries and treatments as well. Specifically, um, garlic extract, ginseng, ginkgo biloba, biloba, echinacea, a lot of things that an aging population might take in order to enhance mental alertness or uh, cardiovascular health or, you know, for, for some mystical, mythical purpose, strength and, and st energy and stamina. But those things can thin your blood and they can occasionally cause trouble with um, uh, bruising and or uh, bleeding during procedures, even if it's a simple Botox treatment. So these things should all be discussed with the plastic surgeon or dermatologist before any treatment. Um, generally though, once all these, these factors are taken into account, a safe and a pr appropriate treatment method can be chosen for each patient. And barring any big medical problems, things can be done just as they would two decades ago. That's great information, and uh, I think you opened up a, a a new awareness uh, for me and maybe others out there. So uh, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Turkian. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me on. Likewise. Thank you.